namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Buddham Dhammam Sankham Namasami. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we were thinking last time we were here, we had talked about diligence. I was, spoke about one word and um, Aya and Yannicka looked at, at me, we looked at each other and we thought, which one word should we speak about this time? And we both thought simultaneously of the word pasadi. So um, this word sprung up uh, simultaneously together, or I had been contemplating it actually. And when we were thinking about uh, naming our vihara, our, our monastic dwelling, that was still in uh, the virtual mode, the, <laughs> the realm of imagination. We were uh, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and we were uh, contemplating coming to Olympia, and uh, we were with friends, with Ayasan Tusika and Ayachintananda. But we were out for a walk, and um, I was thinking we were coming to the Pacific Northwest, and the word Pacific means peaceful. It was because uh, Magellan had traveled from around, uh, I guess now it's called the Strait of Magellan, but down around south, the tip of South America from the Atlantic side over to the Pacific side, and it was peaceful. Uh, so, uh, so I thought, oh, pasadi as means tranquility, calm, uh, serene. Mostly, it's translated as tranquility, but I like the idea of calm because it's calming. It actually calms, um, and serene as a, a good translation. So that also a sense of peacefulness is there. So when I started talking about how Pacific meant peacefulness, right away, I and Yannicka <laughs> thought of Fasadi as well. We both had this, it's a kind of, those kind of moments where you're united in mind about a thought. <laughs> so um, this word, um, if you look in the suttas, it appears uh, um, usually not by itself. It's a it's a component. It's a it's a factor. It's in, in um, it's in the uh, seven bojangas, uh, the seven awakening factors, and it's also uh, one of the elements in uh, transcendental dependent origination. So, and it um, is usually follows piti. So we have this joy, this rapture that's coming up, and then it's calmed. And this is a, the, the calming, the stilling of it, but not completely fading away. Um, so it's an element within our practice. The bojangas are uh, sometimes called uh, awakening factors for awakening or of awakening. So we can bring these uh, qualities uh, up intentionally at, uh, to support our awakening. So it's interesting that both joy and peacefulness are important factors in uh, liberation. Also with the, with the dependent uh, the um, transcendental dependent origination 
what uh, is the result of that is knowledge and liberation. So this is, so it's an important element in that. So, um, I don't want to talk about both of these. <laughs> these are both very complex teachings, the de transcendental dependent origination and um, the seven awakening factors. They're, it's like this buildup of all these factors and, and qualities that are uh, positive qualities of mind. And uh, so we could see how uh, Pasadi would be an important factor uh, in support of other factors that are uh, supporting our liberation, supporting our, our freedom and knowledge. And how that works is uh, it works together well with uh, uh, sati. Sati is the first of the awakening factors. And uh, these two can develop together, both the sati or the mindfulness, as it's usually translated, and the pasadi. Um, so if we're uh, working with the awareness, sati is a, a type of awareness. And if we have uh, awareness and acceptance of things as they are, this develops that peacefulness. This is these qualities of um, observation and seeing it, things just frankly as they are uh, in accordance to reality. And there's a, um, another, uh, so we're creating the con conditions to bring up peacefulness but through awareness uh, and acceptance. Just bringing up the, the qualities of mind, the wholesome qualities of mind. Um, and even if we're observing unwholesome qualities of mind, to be able to address those skillfully, to be able to uh, see them as they are and then uh, realize their harm and then being able to abandon the unwholesome. And this is another supportive way to uh, bring up this, this peacefulness, this calm, um, by not being averse to what's arising in the mind, what's averse, not being adverse to situations as they are, um, but to be more accepting of things in our, in our own hearts and in our environment and knowing what we can do uh, in response to that. The wisdom will rise more naturally from a calm and uh, peaceful state of mind. We've been uh, quite busy these past few days uh, we just, uh, the Pasadi Viharas become more of a, a tangible thing. <laughs> the, um, uh, we found a rental uh, in, in Olympia. So uh, we noticed uh, people were asking us, are you excited? And actually we were doing things, just going through our, what we needed to do calmly, and we were going to accept, you know, we put in an application and going to accept the fact that we may not, uh, this place was ver seemed just the perfect in a lot of ways. This, there are a lot of good elements uh, to this new location will be for a while. Uh, but I didn't get excited or have a lot of expectation 
that we would get it or a lot of worry that we wouldn't get it. And so when our application was approved, I was, still had this calm. I still had this uh, peacefulness of mind because I didn't get too invested in that we had to have it, that this was the very right place and, you know, this we had to have it. And I... Uh, and now it's just kind of like putting one foot in front of the other. And uh, so there's not that uh, kind of vacillation of the mind where, you know, if we could get very disappointed if things don't work out or we get very excited. But there, this kind of peacefulness, this kind of settledness of mind um, helps with really addressing each arisen moment well. If we're, if we're agitated either with ex disappointment or excitement, then it really clouds our thinking. So this pasadi is a very important element to develop this calm, this peacefulness, along with awareness, along with knowing. It helps us... Um, observe things clearly, and know, it helps that knowing of how to respond rather than reacting. So um, we, keep it, we kept asking each other, like, are we excited yet? <laughs> and, then, and then it was like, oh, I, I think I felt a little burst of excitement. <laughs> but it was like, is this what we're supposed to be doing? Are we supposed to be here? Because it was like this expectation, like people <laughs> were asking us, you know, oh, because we got it, you know? And so, um, no, we're, we're, we were uh, actually, we're happy, certainly. And, uh, but we know it's just, um, we're not banking all our happiness on a situation of uh, something on the material uh, realm. And the material is very important. People need shelter, people need food, all that, all that is so important. But uh, our peacefulness, our, our happiness uh, depends on our minds. No matter what's happening uh, in the world or in our you know, immediate situation, how our mind is responding to it is the most important. Because things are going to go wrong, inevitably. It gets, now it seems like it's like, well, yeah, we, we got what we were hoping for. But, you know, things will go wrong. And so just uh, that steadiness of mind, that um, acceptance of things, in accordance to reality. Uh, I did want to say something about dependent, the transcendental dependent origination just quickly. There's like, it starts um, with true knowledge and vision and it goes, uh, it's at the backwards order of the regular sequence of dependent origination which starts with ignorance. So ignorance being the cause of suffering, this very shorthand, all those uh, links in the chain. And usually we're starting on the side of, of not knowing. This is a normal thing for human beings. We're, we, since humanity, we don't know why we're existing even, right? So, and the Buddha says that this ignorance, there's no discernible beginning uh, uh, starting point for the ignorance. But you can discern freedom from that ignorance that can be discerned. So, and the, in this uh, um, dependent origination, you start with ignorance and it, you slide down all the way down to the bottom, boom, dukkha, suffering. <laughs> and from there, uh, if you are aware of the dukkha and you can just very calmly look at it 
then the in the sada or the the faith or the confidence in the teaching because you're seeing that clearly and um, from that this pamoja arises which is a a form of joy it's just this a and then the the joy intensifies into rapture and then the that's the pt and then the pt calms with the pasadi that's the that's the um so often translated as tranquility so you have that energy from that First, you've, you've, you've really penetrated the dukkha. You've understood the dukkha well, and then this the joys will, it will arise. And even if it's a, a more tentative, even if, it's, if, you, if you're you know, at the beginning stages really examining the teachings, there is this kind of, oh, this, the Buddha was right. I can, under, I can see clearly how we cause ourselves suffering by wanting things to be other than they are, by wanting more than uh, we're capable of really uh, having because it, it, the craving is endless. <laughs> uh, and so we understand that and then the joy arises and then there's that calm and that calm helps us to penetrate further and to go into samadhi. Samadhi uh, arises from that, in, also in the seven awakening factors, there's a, actually sukhas missing there, but in the transcendental dependent origination, the sukha, the piti, is calmed to sukha, which is a, a deeper kind of happiness. It's not the uh, ecstatic happiness of the rapture of the PT. And with that calm, peaceful mind, then the knowledge of vision of things as they are arises. And then that um, there's a, a whole chain of from it's often called the, the Nibbidas, uh translated as <laughs> revulsion sometimes, um, a disenchant, disenchantment or uh, I like turning away, this turning away and then, um, then the viraga or the fading away and it, then the knowledge deepens, the knowledge and uh, liberation arises, and that this is for the full awakening. So this is uh, how the calm is so important factor. Uh, I think uh, we can cultivate, I know we can cultivate that calm, and uh, even if we're not achieving full enlightenment uh, in this lifetime, it can be a, a definite aid for us to really be in this world, be a, um, a caring and um, just an important factor in the world, an important uh, being in the world. So, um, that's I was saying, it's part of the whole package, but it is something that can be cultivated, and it's a supportive factive factor for uh, knowledge and vision and liberation. So I will pass this on to Aya Nianika, because we thought we would be kind of a tag team, and whatever is arising for them, they can share. Thank you, Aya. I guess as I was sitting and listening to this, I am also 
delighting. It's different than excitement. <laughs> I am delighting in the changes that have occurred in me in the process of monastic life, in the practice, the, the process of the Dhamma unfolding. I'm, I'm remembering um, my mother years ago when I was getting out into the world. I feel like we're getting, I, I guess, you know, I'm getting some of that nostalgia of, oh, I'm back in the Pacific Northwest where I grew up. Oh, you know, I, coming in today, it was like, oh, we're going to grandma's house because grandma lived in Seattle, you know. But that's, it's a different situation now because what, last time I went out into the world as a, um, you know, from high school to college and then out into the work world, I called my mom and said, well, I've just accomplished this. We, we've got a Bahara now, you know, that kind of thing. Or it was a job. Now I just got this job, I'm gonna do this. And, and um, my mom's like, oh, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. Yeah, 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 mom. Next I'm going to. <laughs> And I didn't even pause to have any contentment and you know, delight in, in what we were doing and that experience. And on the other end of the phone, there was this silence. And then my mom said, oh, sweetheart, you'll be happy in life at times, but you'll never be content. And there was this splash of kind of cold water on my heart. My, I didn't know at the time my mom was telling me Dhamma. <laughs> But I was like, oh, well, what does that mean? I knew it was important, but I kept striving for years until finally we're in this new starting, this new beginning, and it's different. It's not this excitement and then crashing down and moving on to the next thing. There's this steadiness about it. And I think those are the characteristics of Pasadi, this kind of serene, pacific, accepting, being with, that has a quality of delight that's sustainable. You know, what I was telling my mom in that time was, I am somebody and I've achieved something and I'm gonna do it again. And, and this is different. The way we're approaching this is different. One of the things that looking at how to go out into so monastic life, you've got these stages of learning, lots of stages of learning, but there's this specific spot in the learning process where you then become, quote, independent, which really means you have to learn about your interdependence. You know, it's this thing of you leave the monastery and you go out and you visit the world and other monasteries, and it's not where you like, oh, I've arrived, flipped the, on my graduation cap and now I'm gonna go make something of myself. It's, no, now you're gonna go see reality. You're gonna go see what it's like out in the world. You're gonna see how monasteries are different and the same and how people are different and the same. I have a teacher that says, it's all the same except for the differences. <laughs> <laughs> and that's essentially this attitude of Yes, we are all interdependent. We are all needing each other to make the arising happen. It's a dependent co-arising that's happening. And so going out into the world, I still had that, I, I went out with a lot of anxiety from on my traveling. I, uh, I think was further along in monastic life. So when I went out for the traveling, the first time I boarded the train and came up to Seattle, this was my first stop, year and a half ago, uh, was with a, a belly full of butterflies. And now it's different. It's like the butterflies are just a part of the scenery. It's something that there's a beautification. And how it's happening is the Dhamma unfolding. When we look at those suttas about the arising, it says, in one of the suttas I really love, it's like, you don't need to wish that the calm will arise. It is what happens. You know, you go from the joy 
into this stilling, this calmness. You go into the samadhi, and not there yet, but eventually you go into awakening. And so that's something we can look forward to. One of the things I said as we began this process and as I went out on that journey was, I'm going to develop at the pace of practice. So not the push, 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 to be diligent, as we talked about the last time we were here, to be diligent, but not to push, 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 to let the Dhamma arise, to let the Vihara arise now. And I noticed a couple days ago, I was forgetting this. <laughs> And I was saying something, and Aya reminded me, oh, no, that's pressure. You know, pressure. Now I'm pressuring. And I could feel it in my body. I could feel the difference between being with, having the natural, like, this is what's unfolding next. The, the capacity for us to show up has been so different when we're just taking the next step because it's the next right thing to do. It's unfolding versus push, 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 pressure, pressure. Oh no, we have to get this email out. Oh no, we have to reply to that. Oh no, now we need the keys and, you know. It's so different. So the reminder and having a spiritual companion to do this with that, oh, there's pressure there. And I could remember, it's like, okay, that's not Pasadi. That's not the Pasadi Vihara that's emerging. Vihara also means dwelling in. So I'm not dwelling in Pasadi, I'm pushing. <laughs> and I took a breath and I reminded myself, and I apologized because I was the one being pushy. Uh, and so we have this process of being able to look at and bring back into and abide in. And that's what's really joyful. That's what's really exciting. That's what's really nourishing and that's what is able to be serene and flowing in a good and natural way. So hopefully, this will continue to be the mantra in my mind as we go forward. Um, even last night, not, not really able to fall asleep, and I was remind, thinking to myself, okay, what do I need to bring in now to move toward Pasadi? Mindfulness of the breathing. You know, the Buddha gave us so many tools. So then I was able to turn, oh, I'm not sleeping, so then how about some meditation? And maybe how about some Q&A? How about some Q&A? Do you want to um, wrap it up with the, the teaching part with anything in particular? Oh, um, well, I think uh, that was very, thank you for your sharing. Uh, yeah, my mind just gets kind of spacious sometimes, so I don't really have anything more to say. But um, I welcome your questions. Uh, you can address either one of us for what uh, you may have spoken about. Thank you, Ayas. I had a question around if you would speak to the interconnectivity of one sense of safety and Pasadi. So if one sense of safety is jeopardized, for instance, if you're living in a war zone to the extremity of that, how does one cultivate a sense of Pasadi? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, there's a word, kema, which is... Uh, can be translated as refuge or safety. And um, no matter how it appears, I mean, in this country, it appears like it's a relatively safe country. Uh, and there are places where there's war going on. And that internal safety or refuge that came as a a resort or a oasis or a, a refuge. And it's also um, 
I heard Bhante Sujato talking about with the nomadic people, there was uh, places where they would take uh, refuge in the evening. It was a, a you know, w there was water and there was a, a range for the animals. And the, you know, the, the, they wouldn't wander off because it was, that um, provided their needs. But if we do that internally, not expecting it out externally, because no matter how good things are for us, eventually there, there's sickness, aging, and death for all of us. Or maybe some people die young and they won't get old. But um, so cultivating that inner sense of safety and what is our true refuge? So the Buddha Dhamma Sangha is our true refuge. It's our true safety. And um, I re rely on the Dhamma and that, you know, if things seem to be going so-called wrong, it's like, this is the nature of, <laughs> this is according to reality. Things are not going to go the way I want them to go all the time. So um, that's a really high bar for people in like in a war zone or experiencing starvation or, you know, really hardship situations. But uh, there are these qualities that uh, to be cultivated, um, loving kindness, the four, all four Brahma Viharas, and they're called divine abodes. So that's an uh, inner refuge for us if we have a loving heart and we do what we can in our situation to help other others. But uh, just to know that this is the nature of samsara. It's not, um, I can't fix samsara, but I can take care of you know, the internal, and then I can bring whatever peace and, and loving kindness and care to my sphere of influence. Um, some people have more influence than others, but whatever I can do. And if it's coming from a peaceful, loving heart, then uh, that's the best we can do. So um, just, uh, yeah, there are suttas. It's a very high bar, but uh, there's a, the simile of the saw. <laughs> so a lot of people are familiar with it. And, and that's the high bar in that, uh, that that's like kind of the worst thing that you could, that the Buddha was like presenting at the time could possibly be happening to the, the monastics where uh, if, even if they were severed uh, by a uh, two-handled saw, they were bandits viciously cutting the person up. If they had any hate in their heart, they wouldn't be practicing his teaching. So to really develop this uh, unconditional love for that's the safety that to protect ourselves from hatred, protect ourselves from unwholesome states, and even fear is a type of aversion. And and the not wanting things to be a particular way is a, an aversion. So, uh, not that we're condoning violence or anything like that, but we we can address whatever we're facing the best we can if we're coming from a peaceful and loving heart. Why do we let you answer the next question? Yeah, I know, but just add, because uh, there's more than yeah. one question. Well, this light has gone red, so maybe that means there's an issue with the battery. I don't know. But it seems like it's working right now. Um, so three or four days ago, I had anxiety arose, and this is, was not an uncommon thing, but for the first time I saw really clearly that the driver of that anxiety was a belief that I needed to kind of take an accounting or make a list before I went out into the world of the 
you know, people, things, conditions that I was in conflict with or disapproving of or, um, you know, in some way there was a rub so that I could, like, be prepared and steeled as I went, went out into the world. And I realized that if I didn't have that, that I wouldn't have to have that anxiety. And it, I mean, this feels like exactly what you were talking about. And this is a very new insight. So I'm not really sure how to work with that over time. And I'm just wondering what you have to say about that. I think I'm understanding that you're trying to list all of the things that could be dreadful and have have a yeah be able to be no armored and ready to do battle. And I think that what Aya was talking about already gave you part of the answer probably of uh, the training that we are going through so that we're not bringing hate into our heart in any way. And so I would wonder if that sense of armoring the steel, the bringing that up uh, as a practice of how you're gonna go out into the world, how, what qualities you would label that with? What, if you looked at it as, is this something that's forward leading or is this something that's not forward leading, which side would you put it on? You know, is this something that's uh, opening my heart to the Brahma Viharas, or is this something that's closing me down? Which side would you put it on? If this is something that is uh, nourishing me and helping my heart to be a wellspring for the world, or is this something that puts a cap on my ability to show up, which side would you put it on? And then if you look at it with this, this way that the Buddha gave us of looking at in a detail that's more minute than we usually imagine of what's wholesome and what's not wholesome, holding the bar up to the simile of the saw, there will be no hatred. Then you won't do this hatred to yourself of stealing yourself. Stealing yourself with both, both ways of spelling that. <laughs> Stealing away your capacity to love or stealing, putting a steel armor on as you approach the world. So the exercise I did the last time we were here in preparation for meditation of the breathing and so that you're breathing in and then breathing out as if you're breathing out in all directions and then putting a smiling heart into that so what you're radiating that's your armor. It's no armor at all. It's a, a, a basically a bubble and then a field and then a, an, an unencumbered expansion of love in all directions. And if you go out, that whole list that you create, that's how you meet it. And you'll find that you have more resilience and more resources to be able to uh, meet whatever arises and you don't need to enumerate them ahead of time. So that, that's the way that I've been working with it. Thank you both so much for this morning and for reminding us about the Brahma Viharas. Um, I had written Ajahn Nisabo and asked whether it would be okay for me to make this announcement. And it's almost as if you knew that I was going to talk about um, Seattle Insight is offering a day long on the Brahma Viharas on June 8th. And I'd like to invite everybody to join us. The, um, there are four of us who will be offering this um, day. And, you know, some of us make it, our lives don't accommodate retreats very often. And to have an all day where what we'll be looking at is loving kindness, compassion, mudita, and equanimity. And um, 
So it was just as if you knew that <laughs> we needed to be talking about that. And uh, so I really appreciate it. You can just go on the seattleinsight.org website and get all that information. And um, the two organizations are developing a lovely relationship. And this is another way of, of blending our two sanghas. Oh, thanks for sharing that. Thank you, Ayas, for the tech teaming uh, effort today. I have a question for both of you guys. Um, how often do you, at the uh, monastic life, do you feel that sense of calm or pasadi that you mentioned? So how, kind of like in, in numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, so that I can kind of compare myself, maybe, like, no, like where I am. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so it's hard to quanti quantify numbers. Um, I think um, there's starting to be more of a pervading sense. And what happens is there's blips. And for me, anyway, that's my experience more and more. Uh, like, I, it's not like I'm completely devoid of anger, but I'll s notice the blip. And this is where the, the sati, I was trying to talk about it, the, mind, uh, the, the, the mindfulness, the awareness. If I'm aware that there's a, a blip of anger, uh, I know that I, I shouldn't feed it, and I also see it as a, a danger. And then, so f training like that for many years, seeing anger as a danger uh, helps diffuse it. So I start having more and more of a baseline of, or I feel anxiety. I get caught in anxiety uh, uh, for a longer period of time, but it's, it's maybe a, a little bit of, of static that's going along for a while. And then, um, but, it, but this training helps to keep this baseline of calm and come back to that calm. And, um, and no, just noticing how those blips and, and static and, uh, you know, the, this uh, distortion that happens from the unwholesome mental states is uncomfortable, it's not helpful. And I, I, I talk to myself repeatedly like, oh, I, my question is, is this helpful or harmful? Is this gonna be of help for me to be worrying? Is it gonna change the situation by worrying? No. So it's easier and easier to let go of that which is unwholesome. Uh, so then there's the calm. So it, 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 the default now more is calm. <laughs> and um, also joy. The joy isn't, uh, I feel happiness, but it's um, also not uh, erratic or, or, or blips or um, just like distortions. It's a, it's a calmer, <laughs> everything is calming. When you, when you have those extremes of, of anger and joy, but it's excitement and not joy, it's actually, that's the thing. People say, are, when confusing excitement and joy, happiness, uh, there's a more stability to the happiness. And that way you're, you're not th thrown off and you're not, Grasping or put it, pushing away as much. That's another uh, gyration. Uh, so it's hard to quantify. But it's, as practice progresses, you'll notice there'll be more calmness and stability of mind. And then the, the sati is a protection. That it does protect the mind. So... I hope that's not a quantity, but it's just a process. Uh, did you want to? Sure. 
Yeah, I'd also say it's a process. Uh, one thing I noticed not too long ago, I was talking with somebody, I said, you know what? My baseline, so you can put this on the graph. My, my baseline is happy now. And that was not the case for most of my lay life. And that was not the case in my earlier days of monastic life. And I talk about it being a baseline because there are plenty of blips and, you know, sputters and spurts and, you know, however you want to draw that on the graph. Uh, but the, the baseline is happy. And that is from the Dhamma. And that is from the practice. It's the practice unfolding that is setting a new, like, le what is my level set? And this is saying something from having in lay life gone through serious depressions, serious anxieties where I could not function, could not work. So to be able to say, my baseline is happy, is an extraordinary unfolding of the Dhamma. And, oh, and then I'll hit it back. Yeah. <laughs> Got blips. <laughs> uh, could be. And when the blips do happen, the medicine from the Buddha is right there. And so, I, like, when I, I had that sensation of pushing, I could feel it in my body because mindfulness was present. It was uncomfortable. And I was able to say, I know there's something else I could be doing. So the triggers are not necessarily completely worn away, but the way to respond is programmed in so that your program, when it runs, will have a different graph, a different, different line, and will come back to the settling. And I'm still working on getting to the calm state. That's, that's something that's, you know, a, I trust I trust the equations of the Buddha that the graph will come to that next steady state. Thank you. I was going to say probably that happiness is supported by calm as well. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. just I'm not wise enough to see it yet. Okay. <laughs>